in a point of time while also turning inwards and thinking more and more about myself. So I want to think about that um, as we kind of go along here and see, and see like, kind of what you guys are thinking in terms of that. But um, we want to also, so we think about modern screen photography starting with uh, Prasad, sort of the, the legendary master. He was concerned with form and function of the mechanical object in terms of like framing. You know, notice how perfect everything is. Like the, the woman on the bridge and for the tree and the, and the subtle pointing of the, of the bow towards her and the you know, everything is expertly composed and framed. It's a quote unquote perfect image. So he sort of set the standard for what the perfect image uh, would look like. Um, then we have somebody shortly after uh, the legend, William Eggleston, who sort of pioneered color photography, and he also popularized and coined the term uh, democratized camera. And so instead of only elite, sort of magnum level master photographers utilizing the methods of photography in their everyday life, um, we thought that using color and taking images or making, rather, making images of things that were mundane in the everyday, we thought that was very important. So, um, the right is from uh, a project he did where he just drove across the Southwest, U Southwest USA, Los Alamos, maybe some of you guys are familiar with that book, legendary photo book, both images are from this book, but just an image of a cloud. And it may seem normal to us now because how many of us have taken an image of a cloud that looked pretty to us and didn't think much of it, but when he did this uh, in the 60s, or maybe early 70s, it was, actually it was earlier than that, but um, it was revolutionary. No one would think to um, point and take an image or something, something of that nature. Uh, moving on, then we have, like, we have uh, Dino, who's a Moriyama legend, another legend, uh, black and white Japanese photographer, who's more concerned with mechanical intervention uh, when an image is created. So, like, compared to the last slide. Tonality, perfect. Colors, etc. Like colors, etc. Very well composed frame, you know, well uh, well formed in the lab, all the chemical processes are correct. Then we have this image, which is, you know, sort of eerie and scary almost, and that's mostly due to the processing, I would say. And obviously the the the, the look on the child's face helps, but you know, this the process that he did in the lab and the technical surrogate and the apparatus he used and the way he approached that um, was sort of like his, one of his main practices. Um, and then we sort of four and fast forward to Philip Orbit de Portia, who took these principles and encapsulated them into the modern idea of what we have of a sort of professional photographer now. Composition, we have some grindiness, we have the aestheticism, we have like sort of uh, 30 years of image making wrapped up to, into one style of photography. And now we sort of have a present day. Uh, I'm, sure I'm obviously missing a ton of doubt, but just to kind of speed it along here, we have, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Jurgen Tether W Magazine story that was in 2020 that sort of went viral on the internet and everyone freaked out. And, um, I would say most people thought it was a travesty, and how can you do this to these celebrities? Because this was um, W Magazine's, I don't know what they called it, but it's sort of praising the performance of the year. So they really want them to look their best, etc. But W Magazine got a new uh, photography editor, and you're going to have a shot for them before, he wanted him specifically for this. Um, and so, how do we go from sort of these perfect images in the 60s? And 50s to sort of these democratized images that William Eggleston set forth, and this is where we where we landed now. So I guess um, as I go along, I'm kind of thinking about the photographic ontology, like the nature of photography as its own being, what its function is, uh, what its visceral purpose is in our modern timeline, the downstream effects on our zeitgeist now and before, and I'm not going to answer these questions at all, I'm just going to talk, but it's kind of for you guys to think about, you're smart people, and you know, just kind of think, uh, think a little bit more critically, because I'm, I'm a, definitely a harsh critic of photography, and uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting for that, but. 
All right, the Holy Trinity. Maybe some of you are familiar with this, maybe you're not. Uh, we'll start with Barthes at the bottom left corner. Uh, he wrote a famous, he wrote, I mean, he wrote many, many novels and critiqued many pieces, but he's, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Cameron Bustida, which he wrote, I believe, in 1978, directly after his mother passed. And about two, it was the last book he wrote as well, actually. He passed about a year or two after, after right, completing. But what's interesting is he thought about photography as that has been. So you snap an image and it, that, and you look at it, and that was a moment that did exist, but now it's gone. So it's the continual dying and morbidity of image making. And I bring up his mother dying and him dying, because clearly he was in a more stage of his own life, so that you should sure influence his work and why he was perceiving image making like that. But I think that's that is generally how we perceive image images as well in this day and age. We if I take an image of the audience right now and I look at it later tonight, I'm going to associate certain emotions and feelings on how I felt while speaking to you, and that was an image that's bygone, and I can look back on that with some sort of galvanized nostalgia. So, um, and Krauss on the right side, which I really won't talk about because she had sort of the same idea as him uh, in a little bit different way. But uh, then we have Baudrillard, the simulacra, simulacra uh, which is the postmodern thought. He sort of deviated from the Marxist idea, which is um, humans are built off of commodity and our uh, physical reality within the like, commodity based on our physical reality. And he thought that no, that's not what reality is derived from. Our modern reality only functions on the basis of symbols. The idea of money, status, wealth, ineffable, ineffable. Um, so, and I think that sort of more aligns with the European images and some modern um, idea of making images versus the past. Death. Uh, this is just driving home the, the Bart's point. Every image is a true sacrifice of the moment. Time being fleeting, and time being uh, the most important asset to him. Uh, this was almost like a sacrifice. Each moment was a sacrifice, and to remember that sacrifice of the moment was something very special and nearly spiritual to him. I think the photographer that um, best embodies this is Masahisa Bukase, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If you're not, he, he's sort of every photographer's favorite photographer, at least for some point in their life. Yeah, I mean, his most famous book being The Solitude of the Raven, the reissue is just the Raven, you know, very expensive photo book, but um, brilliant. But fit, and he, live within this space of morbidity and death, just as Barthes was explaining. So what I mean by that is he was in love with a woman, married her for 15, like for 15 years, um, and he was obsessed with her. This is her, she was the muse, the moment, everything to him, and he um, created multiple projects around her, but he, she ended up divorcing him after 15 years, and he made sort of his, I guess it is his penultimate work, because he did make one work after The Raven, but he, he was divorced, she divorced him, he went into exile, and he found solace in the Raven, photographed Ravens for a year or two, and came up with what is probably the most legendary book, but obviously he's recounting the death of his marriage, the death of those feelings, the identity of himself in a new landscape, um, you know, transposed onto these, these beings that have nothing to do with the anthropogenic idea of what he normally would be pointing his camera at, which is her all the time. It went from anthropogenic to the natural world, the natural world being the raven. So, um, yeah, from muse and family and community and these, these, these ideas of you know, documenting our family so we can remember them in a certain moment to the bleakness of the raven. And he's much more in Dido's name as you can see, very sort of abstract, almost impressionist viewpoint. High levels of grain, carelessness with shutter speed, and sort of these technical aberrations that happen that we try to, like, like the modern photographer tries to avoid. But there's obviously like a, another level of emotion that comes from that one. You know, sort of, you can like feel this carelessness and, and searching through the frame of the lens. 
my favorite photo of his wife, I believe, like midway through the marriage. I'm sure if any of you are not on Tumblr, you see this. It's a great, great photo. This is what everybody wants to look like when they when they go to the Hamptons or they are in Malibu. This is the photo they want to take of like their their girlfriends or whatnot, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, all right, I took this photo. <laughs> Um, it, 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 but it, it reminds me of the same, this is uh, sort of really odd, I took this in 2017 or so, and I've, I sort of just became, I was very depressed, I mean, I, I always am, but it was on a sort of different level when I was younger, and I was very alone um, in Colorado, really no one around me, so I, I didn't have anyone to photograph particularly, and my father really likes to photograph mountains and sunsets, so in an effort to probably, you know, move away from him doing that, and you know, sort of work out my own world as uh, Fukase has done with the Raven. I sort of became obsessed with these horses and wild horses in the Southwest, some, some wild, some tame, everything in between. This is the group or a pack of wild horses that pretty much stayed within 30 minutes of my house that I would visit nightly. And they would always run away from me. And I, 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 remember I wanted to shoot film, and I would never shoot film now. This is early on. A 35 millimeter camera trying to autofocus in the middle of the night with the snowstorm and you're running in you know, a couple feet of snow and they're running. I, after probably shooting for two years, I really only have maybe like 20 usable images just because of the nature of like, the, the technology I was using. But I'm using film, 35 millimeter. I'm shooting horses in the southwest. This is clearly a, a Barney point of view, the death of something. It's more than just death of an image of my memory of these horses. It's like the death of the Southwest. It's the death of the idea of the cowboy. The you know the the democratization of this like, it's like Silicon Valley like tech new wave like that's sweeping over America. This is sort of the, the death of that. So it, it reminded me of this. Plus like the 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 way I was shooting this is very very similar to I mean I actually don't have the image but to take an image of snow sort of streaking with no ravens in it. But it has a similar similar affect, I think. More from that era. Um, there, it's odd that these creatures could become more special to you than you were special to yourself or your family or something. You really can transpose and then transgress your emotions when you sort of make an animal about yourself, which I don't think is very healthy, but it's just, sometimes you gotta just show it to. But yeah, I lost something negative to that one, so that's never, never gonna be able to be used, unfortunately. <coughs> and within the same vein, uh, when I moved to LA, and a little bit before I was shooting rodeos, at the same time, I can't fucking find this image anywhere, so I took it from Instagram, so it's, it's crop square, but it is much wider, usually. Um, but it's that same idea, like the death of something, the remembrance of something, you know, like these, these cowboys are still doing what they need to do and, you know, performing in the rodeo space, but it means a far different thing than it used to, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago. So you can just feel when something is at its end and this is what the end looks like for them. Even though this will go on, I'm sure, for X amount of years, but it will go on a, a far, far different way. Um, this is, uh, I came across this photo of me and my father, uh, I think maybe, maybe six years old, no, maybe seven years old at the time, and we were building our family's home. Because um, there's something I'll bring up later in the lecture of this dirt pile. Obviously, many artists use dirt as sort of a motif, and I'm always obsessed with dirt too, and I'm wondering, like, why am I so obsessed with dirt mounds and piles, and am I just sort of copying the trickle down effect from sort of these brilliant fine artists. But I saw this image and I realized in the background that dirt pile was everything to me. I remember sleeping in it, almost living in it half the time because I was too young to really be helping. Like I've helped as much as possible, but that dirt pile was sort of my home. And yeah, this, 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 this image reminded me of like, this, this more, this more idea that I keep sort of harping on. Also, that's really what I wanted to say about this. Going back to uh, the lecture this morning, how that stage was the right 
stage with the professor to be talking about his thoughts and his, his dialect and his speech. This, this house was probably like 2,000 square feet. Not super large, but it was, it was uh, rectangular, almost to the T. There was no like, advanced architecture. We were, we were very poor back then, and we, my father didn't make enough money to actually like, raise the structure to have like, built walls, trusses, etc., etc. So it was just a stage, basically, about a seven-foot stage in the middle of the countryside in Colorado for probably almost two, two and a half years. And we would always work on it. I remember putting tarps over it, and like, the rain would come, and you'd see the clouds roll off the mountains, and it's just sort of me and my father most of the time, and sometimes just me, sometimes my father and mother. But it was like, literally a stage in the middle of the countryside for this sort of familial performance. And now looking back upon that, it, it's just interesting to think about it in those terms. Um, and I guess like everything is performative and has a stage in our life, but this is like a, a, an actual tangible stage. So I think that I want, and I wonder why I remember these memories so vividly. I think that might be why, because it was the correct context for me to really remember what was happening then, and um, I thought that was sort of interesting. It wasn't sort of a non sequitur, but um, <laughs> I. I promised I wasn't going to mix in. I wasn't going to mix in like anything that wasn't just photography, but what I was talking about. It's very, I think, important. myself being it as a child, like the self-portrait idea, and later in the video you'll see we sort of refilmed my parents at later stages in their life and added new footage from modern day, sort of create like this alternate narrative. Thank you, 
this video to kind of make my point here, but it works well and we'll, we'll leave it at that. Management consultants. There are three big firms. And you know. It's a good thing to pause on This is going. I forgot to mention the the marketing point of view really lends itself, I think, the best to artists, the people who want to be artists, because it sort of implies that you. I really like this part. It's a self-portrait of you know me in the womb of my son. But um, it sort of implies that you need a muse of some sort. In this case, it's my parents and sort of myself, I guess, and like the time that we spent together that I can't quite remember or make sense of, but for example, the muse of Kukasi's um, wife. And the muse uh, transcends something that uh, Barthes called studium and punctum, studium being sort of like the mechanical qualities of an image, and punctum being that ineffable quality, the thing you can't quite put your finger on that uh, sort of makes you stay and emotionally moves you. And the, the muse, I think, you never said this, but I think what it does is instead of the, the moment of the image dying with the image that you took, the, the muse can transcend time and image to image so that the, 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 the narrative continues. And I think that's very, very important for like a postmodern sort of plot. Establishing the end of former characters and the proliferation of the, the additional 
additional characters. Very indulgent, but I do think there is a quality that anybody can relate to. It's a lot different without sound, but it's not the point to just so sort of understand it as a standalone. If you if you grew up in America and you had a family, it is highly relatable. <laughs> Mundane images that are the, the landscape is 
speaking for the image on its own terms. I mean, the images that I necessarily enjoy, I just think that these images are sort of important for the, the zeitgeist of now. I mean, many people have sort of like copied the style, and you can probably see this all over Instagram now. Um, this was uh, another sort of reinterpolation of going back to Colorado. So there's like an SSX video, which is all Colorado based, and we have this editorial I did um, with one of my friends, and we went back to Colorado, went to these different locations in my town that like, meant something to me to some degree, like this location, I don't know if I have the image. Like that first image with her on the ground, the rock, that's not the exact same location with my father there, maybe 35, 40 years earlier. And it really hasn't changed much. So, so like trying to re understand or close the, the final chapter is like my time within that space. And like, for example, the gun that she's holding, a 308 lever action, it's like the, the gun when we were, when I was very young, that my father would kill elk with, and I'd kill animals with that as well. We would eat, and it was the only thing we would eat that winter, but like that was the tool that allowed us to provide for ourselves. So, you know, re imagining that through a fashion lens, I thought was very interesting. Well, she's wearing all these painted jeans that she painted, she's painted homes in. And it's, you know, just sort of like mixing these contexts. And although the, the viewer may not understand, uh, if it means something to me, it's probably going to come through in the lens, which I think is important. You know, how my dad's hunting the bass and the town hall You know, she's, you know, praying with my parents. And my mother's wearing the dress. Um, I, some of my father's photographs on the wall, like inside the bedroom and I stayed in the basement. I sort of relegated to because my father thought I was always sick. I was going to get him sick. So. <laughs> and there's an image I didn't include, but talking about recounting my past, um, this is like the first, the first record that I made was in this college classroom and an image I didn't include with the model earlier. Her, she was, you know, posing in front of this wall but in a different way. So. You know, sort of trying to draw these very important, poignant, contextual meanings that will enhance the image for myself that will come through to, to the viewer. I'm talking about context and distance. This is a Michael, Michael Heiser, double negative. He just dug trenches into the Moaba Valley. And it, it, it's, proven, it's proven that there is contrast in a space that you normally wouldn't understand. So we, we, we think of something like the mysterious mundane in a fashion, which would be like Cindy Kimberly and the most recent campaign, walking in like a, I can't it's like an IMG campaign day, but she is walking into a courtroom that she's wearing sort of like stripper clothing, basically. That's like a gross exaggeration of metaphor, but uh, these sort of performance are, and installation pieces are signifiers of that. This is Ernest Fisher, you, quote unquote, and same idea, but sort of a paradoxical approach, digging a trench within a gallery context. And also a very similar narrative, which would be like Dash Snow's Nest, a uh, famous installation uh, in the early 2000s at uh, Deutsch in New York, I believe, or maybe Hauser, I can't remember. But it's the same exact same thing, but with a different applied material that is more closely related to his line of work. So, the dirt to me is trash to me. <clears throat> and I so I just wanted to show maybe sort of like what more recently some of some of my work has been looking like. This isn't even a final approach per se, but it's um, it's nearly there. Um, this is an editorial from Uber Overland that shot me a month or two ago and wanted to democratize and make the office and sort of the downtown structure of any metropolis type city unrecognizable until the last frame. And I'm obsessed with nothing happening lately. Like this, just nothing is going on. It's just two figures passing. This guy passing this newer model, and nothing is going down, but for some reason it draws you closer to the character. Like with the Nicholas Cage images, you're able to, using sort of this mundane background, you are able to scrutinize the integrity of the object inside the frame at a higher level. And when you photograph something, then inherently everything in the frame becomes an object. 
whether you want it to be a non cell or a person, it's, uh, it's a quantifiable object. So, especially in fashion, it's hard because he's wearing clothing from a, a brand, it's a brand special, uh, which I don't say over otherwise I wouldn't want to dress like this. But, um, yeah, when nothing happens, you almost look at it more intently, depending on who you are, but, and then it will, it will sort of tell you more other than um, it trying to get you over the head with some sort of lighting trick or whatnot. You know, the absence of character. And I really, I really love the money, the money images. There's another one later, but, you know, we, the, the idea of a businessman who normally has like a Rolex or AP or some sort of, some sort of watch, but instead of just replacing that with the monetary value and using the numerical value of the, the bills as like a passage of time, um, which we see. Which we see later with the bill, but it's falling on the ground. And the final image, uh, the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the Twin Towers on the New York skyline in Manhattan, sort of contextualizing where this story could have taken place. If you're not really sure, you know, most of it was shot in downtown LA, but the last shot, um, it recreated the Twin Towers in the skyline. And it's sort of like a, a combination of a Barthian approach and a Baudrillian idea. Um, like a postmodern, it's like the death of that has been image. Um, that brings me to, I think mentioned I have a solo gallery in LA. Um, this past summer, and so basically what I've been doing is placing motion sensor trail cameras all around Los Angeles, strapped to poles for uh, many, like for three or four years, and out of probably 1.1 million images, I chose 15 or so, actually it was more like 20, 25, but I chose them and framed them uh, and showed these images and tried to drive them to the point that these images are more, they're not photographs because the camera itself has no aesthetic autonomy. If something passes by, it must take or gather an image. Therefore, every moment is of equal importance, which is sort of what I am getting out when I say I love when nothing happens. If nothing happens in an image, it's more important to me than if something is happening. So, um, and I would never use black and white as an aesthetic choice, I, but the camera's using it for red technology, so it's a, a tech collaboration, which um, I guess that's where I draw the line. These were framed in handport resin frames, which I was a little bit afraid that it's sort of a big truck, small dick situation, trying to make the images seem more important than they are, but I wanted to drive on the objective quality that these are, in fact, objects um, that go beyond the frame of just a photographic realm, because I did not snap the shutter. The project is really interesting because sometimes you just get ridiculous aberrations like this that you would never foresee. Like, why did this image take place like this? It, it just it looks otherworldly. And yeah, the mysterious mundane. This uh, particular set was set in front of a Whole Foods, on um, a pole of Whole Foods, like outside bench. And I really like this image because it's, it reminds me of like, the Protestant Reformation where they started painting um, the plates of cheese and grapes and fruit on the, on the table as religious imagery. And that's what this reminds me of. Like, instead of people eating at Whole Foods, you just have the singular Whole Foods basket. And the child using Whole Foods box is like a sculptural apparatus in rejection of his family. And so just putting the finger over the lens, creating this red blur, which happened, happened multiple times. There's infinite stories within the project. Of this before and after, before and after, before and after. It's similar to like kind of the money image on the wrist that I, I showed earlier. More, more about photography. Um, actually. Before we move off of Ogre 
are and sort of the simulate from watch one more video. Um, and this is sort of like in my mind like the fusion of postmodern image thought and pre-postmodern that we've been touching on. Thinking about like the mysterious mundane aesthetics, thinking of the that has been ideas of art and just the idea of sort of like a, a dream girl in a specific landscape in America. And like how that obsession might unravel and evolve. in these linear, mundane spaces. Always keeping note of the proletariat, the working class, <laughs> the gathering of goods, of dirt, or some sort of other object, and the transposing of that, and the, the extraction of something precious inside of it. Is sort of being how we make this sleek and sexy and make this like make this gold painting and this whole narrative feel as sleek as a dream girl should and how much how much she should feel within a frame. working woman in a working space. I'm like, how does that look?
um, because I think it's the I think it's the photos do need to try. You know, I, I sort of flip off on this because I think on one hand it's the photos about a photograph's identity and it's its purpose to mimic reality or trying to get as close to reality as possible without taking an aesthetic liberty, which is black and white, sort of like making black and white we perceive as like old technology in a case, just nostalgia dating. And I hate when things are nostalgia dating. Hate film photography. Hate film movies that are shot modern film. I hate it all. And I just think that it's I think it's very damaging and plays off of what I was talking about with the miscommunication of photographs being uh, the main way of communicating that would be whether it be Instagram, whether it be you know, any any sort of way you want to look at it. Or even the idea of text, like paper that we're reading. These are obviously symbols that mean something else to us. Um, they've been delegitimized because of the photographic prowess, but photographs are far less potent and poignant in what they're saying to us as opposed to like the identity of a character of a U or a W or an X. So um, I don't think that black and white is useful in the modern era at all. And I would highly recommend that nobody ever shoot black and white. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I have two questions. Yes. So the first regards um, Barnes and Cameron Tito, right? So he came, he, he passed before the digital era, and Cameron, you see the, the argument of, of uh, an image of sacrifice in the moment is because there, it's a physical representation. Like, you know, the film is, is literally ingrained by the photons of the moment. The, the chemical miracle. The chemical miracle. And so I was wondering, I guess my, as, this maybe is, is the bigger question, but it's, what do you see happening when we turn to digital? Do you find bars still applicable? How does it change and all that? I think that bars is only applicable in the digital era by, sort of what I mentioned earlier, it's that it's, he, he also holds on to this romanticization of artistry and the muse, I think, has been proliferated by the idea of his works and this nostalgic barrier that pertains to his idea of an image as opposed to someone like Baudrillard where, I mean Baudrillard was a pretty prolific photographer as well, he never took, even with film, he never took images, because I think he died before that in the digital as well, it, it actually he most definitely did, but he never took images of people, it was always landscapes because he didn't think that, you know, that placing a, a subject or a character within the frame would you know, muddy up the identity too much, and you know, so I think that a healthy mix between a Barthian approach to sort of revel and relish in this idea of being an artist and, you know, like the chemical miracle I just said, that identity mixed with like the postmodern aestheticism to be cutting edge on the ever changing uh, zeitgeist of symbols and symbology that we deal with on day to day, like whether it be what the fucking e girl looks like yesterday versus today or. You know, it's like trying to catch a, a fish in the stream with your hand, you know, it's constantly slipping as soon as you grab it and trying to slap a fly. So I think you have to have a two-toned approach to you know looking at the old, acknowledging the old, applying the new. Yes. That answers what your question is. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's really interesting because also you know, digital photography, like you know, algorithmically interpolates. The scene, right? It's, it's never directly, like, it's, it's never going to be exactly the scene. Right, it's like a, it's a true recreation, whereas film is, I guess, a little bit more real, even though it looks less real. Um, because, you know, it's light capture versus pixel recreation, so there's definitely. I think you're right, I think that probably plays into why images, even though they seem hyped more real today, they seem less real emotionally. You know, that, that, that might be part of the reason I thought about that, but that's a good point. Do you want to go back to shooting a film? Fuck no. Why? Never shoot a film again. Why? It's, 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 you can't do that. Absolutely not. I never, there's no, there's absolutely no point in shooting film. It's just, there's a reason why no magnet photographer is shooting film still. And it's not because they're lazy, and it's not because they, you know, they just, they, they, it's not because they any reason that might be just very simple, it's because like, they know, like, you, like, you, like, photography beckons, like, an up-to-date method. And, I mean, I think, well, I, I, I would never shoot film, but I think that film is very important for, let's say, marketing. I think that photography is great as a 
place the best tool for marketing, like fashion photography. Sure, use your film camera and like recreate something from the 90s or 80s or so and speed myself or whatever you want, but I think it's great for marketing, but it's not great for like, photography as a fine art approach. But I don't really think photography has a place in the fine art world either. I think that a fine artist can utilize photography in the fine art world. I don't think that photographs inherently uh, elicit like fine art nature. Um, but I do think they're perfect for marketing. And I think that that's why they still, like, even if you don't know it, it's sort of this inevitable feeling that photographs are not as good as paintings. And like one of the reasons why I mentioned the end, you know, being like, uh, paintings that are free of aesthetic autonomy because photographs took over the portrait, you know, and like the hyper real, you know, trying to get dot for dot what reality looks like. So I think painting now more than ever lends itself to being a fine art motif and motive as opposed to photography, which is sort of just like corporate drone of marketing, like, you know, you know. No, you're, you're, I think you're very right, but I think it's more so we understand how performative, especially Instagram is, like every image is face tuned, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's hyper, hyper, hyper performative, whereas opposed to nothing happening, a non edited, nothing photo is the emphasis of that, so it feels like a reprieve. And I feel like there's a, a satiating quality to that. And yeah, it just, and I, like, the, the, I feel like the time to be. Beautiful in the sense of like a mycelium type of lighting, you know, like a, a chiaroscara or a, a, a Caravaggio type of lighting in a, in a photographic realm. I think like it's, it's far gone. It's only for marketing purposes now. Like, create drama. We're living drama. Like, you know what I mean? We don't need more. And that's not going to necessarily sell something. It's going to sell something is like, and plus in this like post Warhollian era of the celebrity, which is like somebody is dying, of course, like it doesn't mean what it used to mean, which is why I think those Jurgen images are so brilliant because it just shows how, like, sort of like, it shows their gestures of privilege in real time and how kind of stupid everything is, while also you're able to scrutinize them on a higher level, which may be good for them or maybe bad for their career, whatever it might be, but it just allows a, an entire different layer as opposed to, you know, you're seeing people chop beautifully in the studio, like, we get it. Celebrities are perfect, uh, and I, and I like, why not see them in this new sense and like this landscape that we've all been a part of or we're familiar with. And it goes back to the Michael Pfizer um, installation um, with the, at the Moapa Valley with the dirt dug out into the trenches, which is you're going to be playing on that landscape far greater detail because of these manly trenches as opposed to if they weren't there. And the same thing with the Earth's Fisher U dirt insulation being a paradox at the point of that, but it's in a gallery, so you're looking at a gallery in a different way, and the space in the city, you know, it's, a, it's, it's that sort of thing. But yeah, I think that nothing is the reprieve of the moment, whereas years ago, the drama was the reprieve from the nothingness, you know, because we lived so long with like the mundane aspects of like the post industrial age, you know, like, like factories and wars, like these like sort of things that um, were happening at a fervent rate, but we reached a peak, and I sort of, I guess when we reached a peak culturally in America, we, we declined in a way, and we kind of need to like rip the covers off, and like, it's the morning after, and no one's wearing makeup anymore, and we need to see what the fuck we're doing. <laughs> 
and go to visceral sense, I guess. Not very, that's very interesting to me.
my family's past and what I thought they were doing. So I thought that if I just left it at that, one, it would be too boring because who gives a fuck about my family? You know, and two, there's more to the story than just that. Because if I left it at that, it would seem like I'm just taking the clips back verbatim, but they're not verbatim, there's something else completely and entirely. And with the, the score as well, it becomes something else. But with this, I just want it to be about the picture, but with the, the score, it's an entire new world, I guess. But. Well, I think that people, I mean, people do care about aesthetics, but then it depends on if they know what aesthetics are. You know, aesthetics of somebody might be like MAC makeup all red on their face or something, but it looks like, you know, it's not correct. But so there's like taste is hard and harder to find. So I guess sharpening your perception of, you know, good taste, which does exist. Good taste does exist. I don't know if you tell it doesn't. Um, but um, I've always been hyper vigilant and hyper aware of myself in a room. It's honestly like some of the, the like <coughs> the least aware I've been in a room almost. But I remember growing up, like I would feel people watching me and children looking at me and I was completely frozen. So I've always been very aware of how I was looking in a room or reality. So almost I mean almost LA was a, a good fit because it already embodied those mechanisms and those ideas, I guess for better or for worse, you know. Um, and I'm still more aware than most, you know. So, yeah, I'm very surprised I didn't say the spectacle once the whole thing. And I was paying attention. I did, did I yeah. say it? Oh, no, you didn't. I didn't, yeah. yeah. I, could, I should have actually said it, but I didn't do it. Um, yeah, it's all the spectacle. It's the hyper reality. It's the, the, the performance, the non-stop performance. And we're paying for it with things that we don't even understand, I guess. But, Why would you say you understand artistry, but you're not an artist? Um, I just take it very seriously, and I think that it's something that you dedicate yourself to thoroughly in your entire identity, which I sort of have, but just because you want to be a professional baseball player, and you dedicate every second of every hour, every day, and every year to practicing and being a better player, doesn't mean you're in the MLB. And uh, I feel like that's maybe sort of the state I'm in now, and I feel like it's going to take a lifetime to truly you know, unravel the idea of art in the modern sphere. Just because you have a Kagosian exhibit or whatever, whatnot, doesn't mean you're a real artist. It just means that you are you um, created a product that can be bought. And like you can argue that that is art now, but you know I, I'd rather it be something different and something that's more narrative based, as opposed to just you know a monetary incentive or behind it. There's obviously a tribe to market now, which is fine. Like, that's cool. Like I mean, like Warhol, like, you know, it's nice. But, there's obviously something much deeper sociologically, anthropologically, ideologically that is to be unraveled and understood, especially in this modern time. Where, like the world is so crazy. Like usually it takes, you know, used to take hundreds of years for things to change, but they change what what took hundred years to change five hundred years ago takes two days to change now. So it's very interesting and I think something brilliant will come of like the next twenty to fifty years artistically. And Trying to get hard to try to dig dirt out of the hole. No more dirt in the hole, you know, just dig it out and like, try and move the barometer via like, any vehicle possible, I guess. Go once, go twice. <laughs> yep. So, you any of that Tumblr, I know it's like this um, website that you can just sort of collect images um, and just like have. Like show off your eclectic taste in things. So I was wondering, um, what things are you obsessed with? Like right now? Right now. China. Obsessed with China. Xi Jinping. I'm obsessed with Xi Jinping. There's this video of Xi Jinping. Uh, it's my favorite video of the last decade. Honestly. Best video I've ever seen in a decade, no doubt. And it's for last year, and he. 
uh, is, in, is in Congress and sort of the C-SPAN camera angles and it zooms in to Xi and the ex-president who's sitting in his own heart. Yes, you know, and he gets ousted and all of a sudden he gets taken away. It's so, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I highly recommend it if you watch it. That moment, and then the zoom out, and you see the entire congressional court the signal and hand, like the signal and hammer. It's one of those beautiful things, eerie, hopeful. It's uh, it's brilliant, and I watch it. I watch it probably three or four times a night. I put different songs over. I like putting like a John Frusciante song over the point where the ex president touches the shoulder of Gigi, like trying to get him to allow him to stay, and like, triggering like a John Frusciante song then because Gigi lived in Iowa in like 1986 for a year with a family and that's how he came up with the idea of merging Manifest Destiny with uh, the Red Party, you know, sort of mandate heaven and wanted to make China westernize while still retaining the Red Party ideals but he was obsessed with James Dean. He was on a corn farm. It was crazy. And so like this twangy drum for Chante, like hazy drugged out guitar over that moment offering like a hopeful equilibrium and also like horror. I would I watch I don't know, yeah, I watch it all the time. That's what I'm obsessed with. It's a it's we use it as stage we use it as stage visuals for part part of the performance we did in Las Vegas where these four giant screens that were like wall sized and the, the sound sucked but the visual there was like you know this G walking and then there's horses all after like running out and like this sort of exit procession I guess so I don't know I'm obsessed with China it's very interesting and um, yeah I don't know I'm sorry Have seen uh, Trust by Hal Hartley? No one's seen that? Holy oh, shit, you guys got it. I just watched that. Um, it's probably one of my favorite. I think it's my favorite movie I've ever seen right now. Um, that was, it was one in the 80s, so it's not too modern. Um, I really am excited, I'm excited to see Agra Drift, the Harmony Grimm film. Which is a good film, it's more of like a Halo rendering. But, um, and I would really highly recommend going to see his exhibition in LA, the Housing World of the thermal screen grabs from the film, but they were printed in jets and technically paintings. They look vivid, they're beautiful, uh, really, it's a really good uh, install. Uh, I like movies. What did you say before that? Who do you think is a, a true artist? Yeah. Um, I mean, they definitely exist. I don't know why I'm liking They're definitely, like, I was just thinking about earlier today about, um, yeah, this, I mean, they're definitely out there. And just, I mean, not to be this guy, because there are other more low key and, you know, people that I should mention, but somebody like Kanye West is a true artist. It is what it is. I don't know if it's out of you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if you want me to say New Year's Long T Shi, I'll say New Year's Long T Shi. You know? I feel like putting Jean Frusciante music over Xi Jinping is art. <laughs> <laughs> right, is it not? I don't, it, I mean, it, I guess it is if I wanted to be, but yeah. right now it's just because I, I need to, which I guess maybe further to the point, but me putting the drum shot this song over it allows me to understand G's positioning far better than if it's just it's like a stacking. Yeah, and, it, and I, I feel like I can understand the man who Western media wants to make out as a villain, because to a degree he is a villain, like he's done horrible things to many people in his nation, but also. You know, he's a polarizing character who I think should be respected and watched closely, and that allows me to like delve further. I think, or maybe it's just what I want to see happen. But you keep it regardless. If you guys come tonight to Broccoli, think of Broccoli Forest, you might see G or G on the wall or something. <laughs> Anybody else have a question?